because I'm now aware of there being so many bloggers out there, some of the names of which I recognise, some I don't. Um, you know, there seems to be a huge amount of people who are who are blogging and writing about cricket, which is, you know, on one hand, is fantastic that people are, are interested in doing that, and they now have a means of doing it. Um, it's also a, a, an unfortunate state of which I've gone into, and I seem to have fallen out with quite a lot of them um, over not differences of opinion. I mean, that's that's not right. But the bottom line is that you know, I think that there are two clearly defined roles, and because of Twitter, those roles have become very blurred. You know, the blogger um, has now got the platform to air his views, which are often actually quite different to those of the of the journalists who work, you know, who, who work with the, the cricketers, work with the game every day of the week. And I think this is, this is possibly the most important starting point of all this, in that. It is. It, it's, it's the blogger, the tweeter, whoever it is, who, who he or she makes the first contact with me or the journalist. The introduction is made by them. We don't know who you are. Uh, we don't know you're out there. So the introduction is made. And, and I think where the, where the, the, the first point that I really want to make about, about social media and this, although I've got slightly off your first point, but, but just as in meeting somebody in real life... That introduction, actually, is probably going to pave the way for your relationship. Therefore, if the introduction, which always comes from the bloggers stroke tweeters side, because we don't know who you are, if it's aggressive, abrasive, you don't, you're not doing a job properly, you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what you're saying, you're talking rubbish, where is that relationship going to go? If I walked into your office and kicked the door down and said, you're crap at your job, what are you going to think? I suppose we think that we know you. I mean, not just you, but people in your position, because we read you yeah. or hear you. So you're part of our lives already. Um, but I suppose the point you're making is that you've no, you have no idea at all who we are, and that's the very first thing you've heard from us. Absolutely, no idea at all. You know, we well, our names are out there. You know, I'm Jonathan Agnew, I'm the BBC cricket correspondent. I don't know who these. You know, <laughs> I don't know who anybody is out there really, because even if someone puts a name up there, it might not be the real one. So you don't know if they're male, female, six or 60, um, from what part of the world they've come from. Uh, you, you, you just have no idea at all. You don't know how much they know about cricket, if anything. So it, it, it's a confusing state. If, if, I think what people have to do who are, who are looking at this is they, they have to consider, if they can, when they sit there and are ready to, to, to write whatever they want to write, that... They are actually coming straight into my space, my workspace, my personal space, wherever it is. They send something, beep, it comes on my computer, my laptop, whatever it is, bingo. That's their introduction to me. Now, if their introduction is polite, courteous, respectful, interesting, not, you know, pleasant, then the odds are that from me they'll get a reply that will be polite, personal, decent, and hopefully helpful. If it's not, if that's the way the introduction is, if it's not like that, then they're certainly not going to hear from me, and they're not, they, are, they may, might possibly never hear from me again and be kicked off. So what's the point in, what is the point in coming on and making a rude, inflammatory introduction? The answer is there isn't, unless you just really want to cause trouble. I'll so, pick up on a few of those points in a, in a moment, Agus, but yep. I want to ask a more general thing, because the last six months have been, or I've followed cricket for 31 years, um, and almost starting from England's first innings collapse on the second day at Brisbane, have been constant trauma on and off the field, the way it's felt to me. What's that been like for you as a lead commentator, as a cricket correspondent? What, what, are those, what have the last six months been like for you? They've been very interesting. You know, I, mean, I mean, sport is all about ups and downs. Um, and often as a correspondent... Um, uh, you know, someone who is assessing and paid to assess uh, a sporting team. It's actually, it's actually more interesting when they're losing because you've got more of your own input to say what you think they should be doing right. When they're winning, well, you can just say, well, they've won again and they're brilliant and they're fantastic and aren't they playing well? But, but people want more answers when they're not. So that's, it's, it's more interesting. It's obviously more challenging. Um, 
And whereas four years ago, or, or let's just go back to Andrew Flintoff's tour, you know, that, that um, hideous tour, there wasn't then anything like this sort of feedback. There wasn't Twitter then that I was aware of. So you did your work, you said your stuff, you put your line down and you went out and had a meal. Now, of course, with, with, with Twitter, there is that response back to what you've said. Um, and, you know, the, the thing, it's interesting, again, that, you know, what some people might say, oh, you know, he's, he's, he's moaning because he's getting some stick. I, the, the majority of feedback I get is very positive. You know, most people, thankfully, like what I do. It's, 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 just a, it's, a, it's a small minority that I, I believe that, that, you know, gets up there and makes a lot of noise and, 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 and so on. So, you know, don't, I don't want people to think that I'm just coming out here because I'm getting a bit of a hard time. I'm not. I'm getting a hard time from some people, um, but overwhelmingly, the, the feedback that I get through TMS, through email, through Twitter, and everything else is very positive. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm not doing this to try and reclaim ground. I'm trying to do this to try and make the relationships better between uh, tweeters, bloggers, and and the journalists, because I just think it's it's time to do it. On a general level, and obviously you can only speak for yourself, but from where I um, view things, there is a lot of discontent and um, a soured relationship between many vocal supporters uh, and the media, the cricket media in general. Why do you think that's happened and what, what's the dynamic that's occurred there? I think that the Kevin Peterson story has really brought things up to, to a new level. You know, it, it, it's been... It goes up and down Twitter, you know, you, you get spikes of, of hostility and aggression, then things go away and they move on to something else. Clearly, um, high profile, big number bloggers like Piers Morgan taking a very um, aggressive stance has stirred people up um, uh, and, and stirred up people who actually, you know, agree with him. Um, so there is out there a, a lot of people who think that what the board has done is wrong. What's interested me about it, and I just look, I've actually just looked back now, before I did this, at the piece that I did when um, Peterson was sacked. I'm just going to look it up again now, because I want to get it right. Because it's become, it, it, I, think, I think what a, a lot of the problem is, that because the board hasn't said anything, and because Peterson hasn't said anything, because they've both been bound by this deal, neither of by the way, are taking responsibility for that. And I've heard from both sides uh, as to who was responsible for that confidentiality agreement. So that rather sums it up. But my piece here, you see, on the BBC site, couldn't have been straighter. You know, I have, I have simply said that it's come down to those people who run the game, those who are in the team and around the team, to make this decision. It's got nothing to do with journalists or anything like that. It is... It is those who run English cricket who have made this decision, and they are the ones that have to live with it. Now, that is not a journalist saying it's the right thing to do. But it's been, you know, gradually people have decided that I believe it is right for them to sack Kevin Peterson. I think I've been very balanced about it, actually. I know that there have been issues on either side. Um, but somehow that, that piece, which is dated 4th of February, you know, I'm perfectly happy with that piece. It's balanced. It says the good, the bad. I said it's a desperate shame he'll never play for England again. You know, I've said he's, 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 he's played shots there that not even the Richards could have played, blah, 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 blah. You know, entirely balanced. But this whole debate, the whole, well, not debate, the, 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 the whole Kevin Peterson business has not been anything to do with the media at all. It has been purely to do with the ECB and Kevin Peterson. And because neither side has said anything, those of us in the media have had to put stuff out there and views out there. I've talked to lots of people. I haven't spoken to Kevin about it because I haven't had the opportunity. I'd like to. I've spoken to other people about it, so I've, I've only really had one side of the story. One day, hopefully, we'll have both. But because you've only had one side of the story, and because, for instance, I interviewed Paul Downton the other day, some people have taken the view that means that I'm anti-Kevin Peterson. I want to see England play their best side. That doesn't mean to say that, that Kevin will be in that. You know, I don't think you know, people say, um, you know, people say what they like. They don't actually really know what I think about Kevin Peterson, actually. Um, 
all but all the only side that I have had to present so far has been the boards. That doesn't make me a lackey, as some people suggest. It doesn't make me an ECB mouthpiece. I'm simply asking questions, getting answers from one side. We haven't had it from the other side yet. Do you think that the media in general uh, could have taken a more rigorous questioning line with the ECB and challenge their line more? Because there is the feeling in many quarters that questions haven't been asked in the mainstream press, which have been asked beneath the line and on blogs and on Twitter. Yeah, but they haven't been asked of the people who have the answers. It's all very well. We all know what questions you want to be answered, but you won't get answers to them yet. Now, when I interviewed Paul Downton the other day, I had a chat with him out in the middle first. Someone took some pictures of that. I was chatting to him about how, how we're going to do our interview. And he said, I'm not going to talk about specifics. I can't, and I'm not going to. So, therefore, I know that I've got some skirting round to do. And the last thing you want as an interviewer is for your interviewee to feel that you're trying to stuff him or there's going to be a question coming. Um, so you don't want him to be defensive. And you don't want to hear on an interview someone saying, I can't talk about that. I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. I can't talk about that. You don't want, you don't want to hear that. So therefore, you have, you've got to make your way through an interview which runs, you know, hopefully seamlessly and getting more out of a person by making them feel comfortable and relaxed and, and prepared to talk. And, you know, I know what issue you had about the senior players. Well, he wouldn't have answered that question because he wouldn't have told me what senior players. I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable in my own mind because we know what Cook has said. We're pretty damn sure what Matt Pryor has said. We haven't heard anything, actually, from James Anderson either way, so who knows. But the captain and vice-captain, actually, at the end of that tour, there weren't many senior players left. So to quote Chris Tremlett or Michael Carberry's views, I mean, you know, they're just it, you know, they're, they're not relevant. Um, you know, and presumably also a pretty good shout that some players are going to say something publicly and some other things privately. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an argument which everyone's guessing, but I could have asked that question, but he would have said that I'm not going to answer the question, I'm not going to answer it. And so, you know, you, you, you don't really, you don't get anywhere through putting people on, on the defensive. I mean, in fairness, that interview drew, drew a lot of praise as well. Um, I mean, I did criticise... Um, the fact there were some questions there which I wish had been uh, asked, and you've covered that now. But if you were to do that piece again, would there be one question that you would have asked that you didn't? Well, I, I could have asked that. I know what the answer would have been. So, I mean, yeah, perhaps, perhaps, I, should have answered, perhaps I should have asked it. But I, but I know what he would have said. So, you know, yeah, I, 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 I could ask it, but we wouldn't have been any the wiser. I think, I think the main point of that interview is that, and the reason that, you know, you, and you say it did get a lot of praise because it got a lot of, it did get a lot of new stuff out there. You heard Paul Downton speaking properly for the first time, not two hours after his father had died, which is how it was when he appointed Peter Moores as coach, which was lost on the majority of people. His father had died two hours before he did that press conference. Now, you heard Paul Downton there speaking, you know, okay. To, to, to a lot of people in a, in a reasoned, straightforward sort of a way. I don't like the way he used nicknames, and I've, 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 told, I've told him that. But I think the main point of, of the hostility was that people didn't like the answers that were given. And that's sometimes when the questioner gets, gets shot. But, uh, but I have to be honest with you, easily the same number of people who were opposed to it thought it was a great interview, and, they answered, you know, and he answered all the points. And that's been the really difficult part of this, this last couple of months in particular, that it has been so divisive, it is so split down the middle. I hear majority views this and majority views that. Well, that's not, that's not how my Twitter line reflects it. I would say it's 50-50 at best. And it's, it's usually those who have a real beef, who have a, an anxiety and a cross about something, that, that tend to make the most noise and, and, and protest more and go on and, on to, um, you know, and, yeah, make, make their protest. Uh, you know, and, and, and those who, are, who aren't uh, unhappy tend to sit there quietly and let, and let life get on. But, you know, it's, it, well, this last week's been a classic case. England were going to beat Hammer Sri Lanka at the Oval. All nice and quiet. You get a flood of people saying, this is great, new look, England, well done, terrific. You know, they don't need KP. Three days later, and you get all the other side. That's an avalanche of bring back KP. This is a disgrace. I suppose KP will get the blame for this. Yeah, it's utterly predictable, but that's that's Twitter, you know, and, and so you, there are two extreme arguments out there, and as a journalist, trying to 
pedal the middle line, you get both arguments. You get you get hit you get hit by both. There is also a feeling, um, and this is generally, uh, I've heard expressed many times, that the England setup and the press in general, not going to pick out any individuals here, exist in a, in a kind of a bubble. I mean, they're travelling the world together in close proximity. Many of them are ex-players and possibly have more in common with each other than with the cricketing public. Uh, how valid is that view, do you think? I think it's, I think it's a perfectly valid view. I, I don't think there's necessarily damage in that. I mean, I wouldn't think for a minute. I mean, if people have read my stuff of the last, well, starting with Stuart Broad not walking, I suppose. I mean, that's hardly an ECB management line to take, is it? And I've, I've been very critical of England ever since. From when they peed on the pitch at the Oval, to the way they played in Australia, um, you know, decisions that have been taken. I've been, I've been very critical of England all the way, you know, from, from well, from that, that Broad onwards about their sledging, their attitude, I talked to Paul Downs about their complacency, jealousy of Kevin Peterson. I asked, I haven't seen that question asked before. I think it's less the players themselves. I think, I mean, just generally, I, I just sense a slight lack of awareness of the disconnect between the people who run English cricket and the people who follow it. And that doesn't seem very often reflected in the media as fulsomely as it could be. Uh, have, you, have you ever noticed that? Um... Well, I mean, you're right in that everyone is sort of in, you know, people who, who work in this sport are in it together, be they journalists, players, board, sponsors, you know, whatever it is, you are, you know, it is, it is the world in which we live, it's the world in which we operate. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I suppose if you, if you were looking for, you know, I, I, I don't know of a of a, of a single journalist who gives the board an easy ride because he thinks that's the right thing to do, um, because his hands are tied. He might think he might give the board an easy ride because he thinks that they're right. Um, but you know, people. I think what I think what people are, you know, like you must understand is that we have our own integrity at stake. Um, I go back to the Mike Atherton dirt in the pocket thing in you know in the early nineties when he was the England captain. That was my integrity on the line. Um, and so what do you do? Do you tow a supposed party line and look a prat? Or do you, are you honest with yourself? And I think that's the question that everybody has to write. You know, it has to write by with a bit of spoken word or a written word. You, you, have to, you have to do what you think is right. Otherwise, you, know, you end up looking a bit of a prat, I think, you know. I, I know that I can now talk with absolute impunity about ball tampering. Um, I'm not tied to any team or, or anything else because I, I stood up and said what I think about it. There might have been one or two others perhaps who, who, who wouldn't feel quite so comfortable doing that. But, you know, I think, you know, again, that's something that really makes me very cross. And I do try and be scrupulously fair. There's stuff going on about the Sri Lankan bowling actions at the moment. I'm being accused of all sorts of stuff. You never say this, and you, you know, if it's English, when you're into that, hang on a minute. You know, I, 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 I was calling Sananaga's action during the World T20. You know, it's not just, it's not just sudden, suddenly something has happened. And he's not alone. I, I, if I see someone who I think's bold in a suspicious action, you know, you say so. If there's an English person out there with a, a dodgy action, you'd say so. You know, you, you, the, 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 the thought that you're biased... Um, is, is well, it's obviously the worst thing you can say about a commentator because you you have to be impartial. And again, you know, if someone wants an instant block, come on and call me biased, and you'll be gone. You know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put up with that. It's just not true. And 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 it, it'll be some sort of assumption that will have been made on. You know, I, I I have had people tell me that I've written and said things which are completely the antithesis of what I believe. <laughs> Therefore, I'm not going to have said it, am I? But you get it thrown at you. So. Um, to your question, no. Everyone is. You know, I can understand why. Uh, to, you know, to to people who follow the game, and I'm being very careful here not to use inside and outside. So I know that really bugs people. And that press release that the board did was a was a disaster, in my view. I think they were referring. To, I think they were referring to Piers Morgan one probably as, as being outside the game, and they they, they just made an absolute hash of it. I don't think for a minute they meant their they meant for their fans to feel they were outside the game, but that's how it was interpreted.
but I can understand why you know people from 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 you know that position do look at those of us who are doing a job and think, well, you're all in it together. You just rock up and talk about cricket for a bit. It's all nice and easy peasy. You get your back stroked and you you don't put a foot out of line and, and, and everything's going to be okay. But it's not. It's, the reality is not like that. Um, last question on this subject before we move on. Um, there obviously was some criticism of uh, the Waitrose promo film from a couple yep. of weeks ago where, uh, just to explain people who are not aware of it, um, you did the voiceover for a uh, short Waitrose promotional film tied in with their sponsorship of the of the England team and obviously there was an ECB connection there. Um, what was your, looking back now, what, what's your position on, on that film and your role in that? Well, I put the words to it and I should never have done it. You know, I, I was just caught off guard. I was told it wouldn't be broadcast and that was it. You know, and I... And I massively regret having done it and I have apologised for it um, it, it's ironic and it doesn't affect it doesn't in any way it had nothing to do with the board from my view at all I mean I, I was told it was only going to be shown within within house in Waitrose for whom I've worked for three years and I'm a freelance so that needs to be cleared up as well I'm a freelance I'm not BBC staff um, you look at my website I mean you know I I, I work for lots of other people. Um, that wasn't through choice. It was the way I was employed in 1991. Or, you know, not employed, but the way I was taken on by, the, by the, as correspondent. And I am. I have no BBC pension. I'm not. You know, I'm not a BBC staff person. So I am a freelance. Therefore, I am entitled to work elsewhere. I have to. So I have worked for Waitrose for three years. Um, I write for them every week about a variety of subjects. Um, it is checked every week by someone at the BBC. And there's never has a single word been changed, um, and uh, you know that needs to be. We need to look, just make sure that that is intact again. Has, has the landscape changed? No. I've written twice about cricket since Waitrose became sponsors. Both of them are critical of English cricket. Um, you know, so again, I go back to the point where you you just simply go by your integrity. But I wish I hadn't done that promo. It was something that slipped through the net. Um, and as soon as I saw it, I was horrified, and um, you know, and I, and, I, and I bitterly regret it. But people, I hope, will allow me one mistake, an error after 25 years, and uh, you know, that it, it, it's not showing any allegiance to the board at all. It was just something else caught off guard and made a mistake. Um, thank you for that. Just um, moving on, um, the fracture between the ECB. We'll take the media out of it now. Between the ECB themselves. And England, the England supporter base. Do you think if England, say, win every Test match uh, this year, will that be enough to heal those wounds? Do you think? Well, uh, it's difficult for me to answer that because, uh, you know, again, my 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 feedback on, on on Twitter is that yes, there are a lot of people who are very unhappy about what's happened, but there actually, all, uh, you know, <laughs> equally, it seems that there are some people who think it's, it's, that it's the right thing to have done. So. You know, I think it's wrong to assume that everybody um, thinks that what has happened is, is the wrong thing. That isn't true. Um, clearly, as I, say, as I said earlier, the people who have a you know, who really feel angry and frustrated and you know, about all that, they are they are going to make the most, most noise. You do your protest group, angry people make more noise than, than satisfied people. So, will it make a difference? Well, I hope so, because at the end of the day. The people who made the decision, you, know, you, you hope that they've made the right decision. It's, it, they, you know, otherwise, they shouldn't be in the job. And that's why I go back again to that point about you know, Peterson versus the media. It's not our decision. It's their decision. They will be judged by what happens to the England cricket team. They'll be judged by the media, and they'll be judged by the fans. I suspect if it's a disaster, we'd all be saying the same thing. So you know, I think that's an important point to make. But if, if they have made the right call, then... They've made the right call, haven't they? You know, I think I think they're going to have to. You know, we're going to have to see how this summer plays out. You know, they have taken a decision that they have to start this summer from a real line in the sand. They have got their best player there. They have felt, you would think, or they would feel, that they would want their best player in the team. Anyone would want that. The captain, the coach. The, you want your best player playing, don't you? They have decided they don't want him. That's, as yet, again, we still have not had the sort of seismic 
answer, because I don't think there is one. And I think Paul Downton actually said it all the other day when he said that a lot of trust was lost after the Andrew Strauss business, and that Alistair Cook has gone from wanting him back in the side to shortly over a year later wanting him out of the side. So something has happened there, because under any other circumstances, they would want him in the team. You want your best player playing. So logic dictates that, that there's been a breakdown. We don't know what it is, um, it, 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 essentially. And the fans certainly don't know what it is. You know, they have made that decision, and, and they are going to have to live by that decision. And they'll be judged by you, and they'll be judged by me. Let's talk about um, Test Match Special. Now, you've been the lead commentator and the cricket correspondent for, is it 23 years now, I guess? Is that uh, right? 91 was the first one, yeah. It's about 24, isn't it? I think. Oh. It was quite a step from being uh, a Leicestershire and England bowler to such an important broadcasting role. Um, how did you find yourself in the job? Uh, I was fortunate in that I had done some, and again, this is something for people who want to get into this game. Uh, the best option is to go local, go regional. I went to local radio. Um, and bang on the door and got some part-time work there, wasn't paid anything, I did it, got some experience, got into radio, got a job at Radio Leicester in the winters, and then you know, Christopher left, Chris Warren Jenkins left and went to the Telegraph, so the job came up. So you know, I was able to apply, not having done any commentary at all, I hadn't commented on anything, <clears throat> but having got a bit of a radio grounding, and I worked for the tabloid newspaper, the, the Today newspaper, um, and as their correspondent, I was the first professional cricketer to become a cricket correspondent of a newspaper and that caused a bit of a eruption uh, within the media and you know that was quite, quite an interesting time but yeah, but I mean I, I'm just a, you know, I'm a more comfortable broadcaster than a writer I get very stressed writing um, that horrible empty screen whereas talking just sort of comes naturally really so um, I'm I mean, I'm very comfortable doing the role um, the role that I do and, and it, it is a it is a, it is a very much a, a communicative role, which is why, again, the social networking I see very, very much part of part of Test Match Special. I mean, Brian Johnston would have loved email and Twitter and all that. He'd have been on there, you know, because that's 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 what we do. We communicate with people. We talk to people, um, and that's just an extension of it. Um, access um, to cricket has changed uh, a lot in the last few years. You can access cricket in more ways than you did before um, through tablets and through many different websites, but there is no longer any cricket on uh, free-to-air television. How does that affect the role of Test Match Special, do you think, both of those phenomena? Yeah, that's a question. I mean, I think it's, it's made us very important as far as the board is concerned. I don't think they could have had that big megabucks deal with Sky um, without us providing easily accessible coverage of the cricket during the day. You know, I think that's very important. Um, we get on very well with, I mean, you know, the Sky Boys, you know, we, we, we are, you know, you go back to your early point, we are all in it together. We are out there sometimes mixing it at the end of the game. You've got to look after yourselves and get your interviews and, you know, you've got your heads down and you're, you're, you're working hard. You know, so I, I think it's, it's fair to say that the broadcasters tend to keep themselves well, it's interesting. The Sky team tend to be more detached from the writers um, than probably I am, actually, because I, because I do write. I was a writer, and I often have the writers on with me on the radio. So I've probably got a closer rapport with those. Of, they're usually on a different floor, uh, and I go down and see them, um, the, the writers, you know, whereas the TV guys tend to uh, stick more to themselves. But I think, uh, you know, BBC Radio is, is critical to to what the ECB does, and, it, and, and our numbers have grown as a result. I mean, I do think that access for kids watching telly is is an issue. I think that's you know, and I feel for people who say they can't afford Sky, they want to watch it and they can't, and so on. That that's you know, I think it's it's a, it's an interesting debate. I don't think England would have got to number one in the world without Sky's money, and everything, the infrastructure, everything that was put in place to get them there, the England there. Um, but similarly, where are we going to be in 10 years' time unless there really are steps taken to, to give kids, in particular, access to cricket? And the ticket price is going so high, um, it's becoming more and more difficult, I think, for, for mums and dads to, to introduce kids to cricket because it's not on, on terrestrial telly um, and it's, they're being priced out of the market as far as um, spectators, the live spectators is concerned too. 
Now, this might be uh, sound an unfair question, but um, of all the summarisers you've worked with over 23 years... It will be an unfair question. If you had to pick one for your fantasy commentary session, who would it be? Or maybe an amalgam of two or three of them. Because, um, uh, you know, you don't know where you're going to go with Geoffrey, and he and I have probably had, you know, some of my favourite moments on there. But there are times he comes on, he's a complete pain in the backside. Um, and now, and now, but the majority of times he comes on, and you don't know where you're going to go, what you're going to talk about, or anything else. And, you know, I love working with Geoffrey. We're a bit of an odd couple. Um, but the mix seems to work. We both respect each other very highly. I mean, for all the mickey taking of me as a bowler, he actually does respect me as a cricketer. Um, we had some good old tussles when we played against each other, um, and I've got enormous respect for him as a, you know, as, as, obviously as a, as a batsman uh, and as a broadcaster, who's someone who's very professional, always bang on time, always knows what he's doing, always got something interesting to say, uh, makes notes. That podcast will turn up with some spidery scribbled notes that he's made. You know, he doesn't just rock up and knock it off. Uh, and that's at the age of nearly 74, you know, so he really is an old pro uh, in every sense of the word. But, you know, I've worked with some great people. You know, there's no one, really, that I've sat down there next to the radio with and thought, well, I, don't, I can't get on with you very well. Um, you know, there are some that are, you, you, you can sometimes click on air better with people than, than with others. I love working with Phil Tufnell, you know, Vic Marks, Michael Warney, all these people. You know, they're, they're, all, they're all different. And so they find, as commentators are all, I mean, you wouldn't get any more different than me and Henry Blofeld to work with from their perspective. Um, and likewise, you know, they are all very different from, from the commentator's perspective. And that's what hopefully makes it a, an interesting listen through, throughout an entire day. And finally, just a, a straight question about cricket itself. Um, there aren't that many test matches now for England uh, between now and the Ashes, only 14 months. What specific things do you think England need to do to, to make themselves competitive for Australia next year? I think there's lots to go to do. Uh, they've got to find a quick bowler from somewhere. Um, they've got to really look at that batting. You want someone to, to step up, um, open the batting. Um, you know, you, you, you need a big player in the middle. Um, it'd be lovely if Owen Morgan from that did did come off, you know, he might get a chance this year, but someone who, just someone who's a bit different. You know, that's what you wanted. I'm talking test cricket now. I'd really like to look at Chris Jordan. He has got some pace. He's a very nice lad. Um, he's just really enjoying playing, and that's what I think England have to get back to. I think the last, you know, going back to, I don't know where it changed. It changed at Headingley against New Zealand. That was when I noticed the real change around the England camp, when they seemed to stop enjoying playing cricket. A lot of very defensive and strange interviews given. They start to play the game, I thought, in a way that, that an England cricket team shouldn't be playing. Um, kind of win at all costs. Doesn't matter about sportsmanship or gamesmanship. It was just not a nice way of playing cricket. Um, they've got to get back to understanding where they all fit within cricket's history and, and where they are in, in, within cricket. And that includes you know, amongst the, the fans and amongst the media. And I know they are going to try and make more of an effort to be more accessible well that's all well and good we'll see how long that lasts for for a start um, and actually generally they haven't been bad I mean you, you, you compare the accessibility of England's cricketers to the footballers for instance you know I think I'm still incredibly lucky to be involved in cricket I can I stay in the same hotel as a player I can have a drink with them over a bar uh, you know you can bump into an airplane in the airport or wherever it may be you know I get a one on one um, with, with, with the players all of the time you know, it might, Mike again doesn't get anything like that. So cricket essentially is still a really good sport. It's 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 a fantastic sport to work in, and I you know, I I, under, I appreciate people's frustrations when they're following it, when they see what's happened these these last few months, and you know, I, I I can understand why people are are angry about what's happened to the England cricket team and, and, and why people are are lashing out, and then people will feel very strongly that England should not have got rid of Kevin Peterson. Of, of course people will feel that. You know, I think where this kind of all started was about trying to make, make us and the whole Twitter thing more, more accessible to each other. I mean, what, what I'd really like to get out of this, as part of all the things that we've talked about, is that you know, I, think, I think Twitter is a fantastic medium and, and, and there's, it, it, it really should work. It works well. It should work well for both parties. 
I get some very funny lines from people on Twitter. There's some really humorous people out there, and I steal those lines and I use them for commentary. I can use Twitter to tell people that I've got a theatre show with Graham Swan coming up in three weeks' time. You know, absolutely. I, that's what I use Twitter for, uh, to have banter with people. People out you know, from, from where you are should be using Twitter, I would think, I would hope, to be getting a bit more insight, a bit more understanding, ask the questions. You might not agree with the answers, but it, it should be a really nice two-way street between people who love cricket and who want to banter about the talking points of it. Not being taken too seriously. 140 characters is, is quite hard sometimes to understand sarcasm or you, know, you, can, you can, things can be misread, misunderstood. Um, you can you can choose a, a different word because it's two characters shorter than the one that you wanted to choose, but you wouldn't get your 140. And you know we've all we've all done it. But all I would say is that for people who I think who want the best Twitter experience from where you're coming from, you are making the introduction. You are walking up to me and you are saying hello in your first tweet to me. And it all depends how that first introductory tweet goes, really, as to what that person on the receiving end of it is going to think of you. We don't know who you are, how old you are, what sex you are, where you live, or anything else. It is all down to that first introductory tweet. If it's a kindly, polite, like I've said it before, friendly one, then I hope that you will get feedback and a nice response. But please do not be surprised if you send a load of vitriol over if you never hear from us again and you get blocked, because you wouldn't do that in real life. Uh, and it'd be nice now we're a few years down the line where, you know, if, if people doing what I do respect everyone out there and understand where you're coming from, understand blogging a bit more, it's not a threat to us, which I think some people perhaps thought it was initially. Um, it's just all part of, of cricket's ever-changing fabric. It's all, everything's digital and instant and communication. So... You know, we have to understand that a little bit more. And I think that people on, on, on your side of the fence just need to understand, you know, when you come into our space, that there are ways in which it will work better.